Hey everybody, what is going on? Welcome back to a very special episode of the Seven Shifts Restaurant Growth Podcast. This week we're featuring the one and the only Danny Meyer, founder of Union Square Hospitality Group, one of the most prolific restaurateurs of our time. We had the chance to host Danny in our offices, virtually of course, for a bit of a fireside chat with our CEO, Jordan Bush. Danny goes into his career, his philosophy on hiring for his teams, a little bit about the state of the restaurant industry, the early days of restaurant tech, and why mayo preferences aren't the best tell of potential fit for a new hire. It was really an incredible conversation, and we're so excited to share it with all of you in its raw, unedited form. We hope you enjoy it as much as we all did. Danny, welcome. Great to be here, and great to meet this amazing team also. Yeah, no, uh, we, we're super excited, and I mean, it looks like the shirt fits just right, so... Um, you know, feel free to just make that your default shirt from, from this day forward. <laughs> I'll, I'll wear it proudly. <laughs> nice. Um, I'm sure you've got a ton of swag from a lot of companies, but we always, we always appreciate that. Um, this, this is the first time I've ever received um, reusable straws with their own brush cleaner. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm glad we, we can be thought of as being unique in that sense. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, to first off, I, I kind of had an, an intro here that, um, that I wanted to, to read off. And obviously, uh, we're, we're super excited. And, and I know that folks, there's a number of folks upon closing the, the investment with EHI, uh, we actually sent a copy of your book to everyone, uh, audio and or paperback, whichever they prefer. And so uh, I, I feel like I don't need to do an intro, but I'm going to do it just in case you haven't yet picked up and read, read Danny's book, setting the table. Um, but here goes born and raised in St. Louis. Danny grew up in a, in a family that relished great food and hospitality. Thanks to his father's travels, travel business, which designed custom European trips. Danny spent much of his childhood eating and visiting near, near and far off places in 1985 at the age of 27, Danny opened his first restaurant union square cafe. He focused heavily on customer satisfaction, laying the groundwork for his 2006 New York times bestselling book, setting the table which looks at the power of hospitality in restaurants, business, and life. Uh, Danny continued to open award-winning restaurants, Gramercy Tavern, Blue Smoke, Jazz Standard, Shake Shack, which is nearly 300 locations now, Danny. Correct me if I'm wrong. but Sounds good. Yeah, um, and several others. But together, Danny and the USHG restaurant and staff have won an unprecedented, unprecedented 28 James Beard Awards, including Outstanding Restauranteur in 2005 and was inducted uh, into the Who's Who of Food and Beverage in America in 1996. And so I just want to say one of the things I admire about Danny um, and why I'm so excited to have the support of EHI is that we philosophically align on so many fronts. Um, we, we both believe in building great teams uh, that have empathy, passion, and a strong willingness to learn and adapt to ultimately create greater experiences for our end customers. And because we know that building great teams translates into you know, either directly how our customers feel um, when they either interact with us on the phone or directly through the use of our product. So Danny, thank you so much for joining us. Let's give Danny a warm round of applause. Or I can hear it one, one country away. Yeah, <laughs> in the, in I'm not sure where I'm not sure where everybody is right now. Probably in a lot of different places. Is that right? Yeah, Danny, are, we're we're kind of scattered here. We're uh, we're in Saskatoon. Several of us are in Saskatoon. I'm not sure uh, if you know where that is, but it's uh, right above Montana, North Dakota. It's a population of about three hundred thousand. So definitely not New York. But I think that uh, was a requirement to to do our geography lesson before making our investment. <laughs> it's a smart thing for sure um we uh we're there's several of us in toronto and uh we've got a small team in uh kind of in the new york hoboken area so uh we're we're super excited and to obviously you know have this team together and you know in a remote setting is is all good we're making the most of it but um yeah we're excited to kind of get back to the office in some some way shape or form eventually um, good so Danny, I, I, there's a number of topics that I wanted to touch on, but you know, I wanted to start with a bit of your background in the early days. Um, you know, and like most restaurant operators, we know it's not uncommon for um, folks to have, have a job in a restaurant first. And I was wondering if you could you know, take us back to your first, first restaurant job. Yeah, well, it's an interesting story because uh, while I have 
grown up in St. Louis loving going out to eat, even though back in those days, quite frankly, the food was not that great in St. Louis. The hospitality was wonderful. People were always happy to see you. Um, but even, you know, I, I think iceberg lettuce was about as gourmet as we got. Uh, we had a, a fancy cheese called Provel cheese, which is, if you've ever been to St. Louis, um, it's kind of cheese food. It's kind of like the Provel version of Velveeta. And in fact, maybe that's where the Vel comes from. Um, but um, <laughs> I will say, I will credit St. Louis with a few things that have definitely impacted my career, like um, frozen custard and smashed burgers and uh, barbecue. So we've, we've done some things with that St. Louis, but it never dawned on me that I was going to go into the restaurant business at all. And the only thing I knew is that I liked restaurants, but I was a poli sci major. And if you were a poli sci major undergrad, uh, the typical thing you did was one of two directions, get a journalism degree because your interest in politics was issues and you wanted to write about it or get a law degree because your interest in politics was going into politics. And I almost applied uh, to be a lawyer. Uh, I took my LSATs, as a matter of fact, and just great, great good luck that the night before my LSATs, I was out with my uncle who's uh, still around and kicking. And he got really mad at me because he said, I've never heard you once say anything about wanting to be a lawyer. And I said, well, I don't. And he said, well, then why in the world would you do that? You, you're going to be dead for a whole lot longer than you're going to be alive. And I said, because I honestly don't know what else I could do or what I would do. And he got really mad at me. And, and he said, you got to be kidding. All I've ever heard you talk about your whole life is restaurants. And, you know, the, the thing I should probably share, because I bet there's a, a few people on this call right now who are on your marketing and sales side, is that... Um, during those early years after I graduated college and before I took my LSATs, I was the leading salesperson uh, based in New York for a company that sold electronic tags to stop shoplifters, which is like the last thing I wanted to do for a living. But I was making a ton of money in commissions and I was single and I didn't have anyone to support except for myself. And I just kept putting my commissions into the company's stock. They went public at there was what is now NASDAQ in the United States back then was called over the counter. Mm -hmm. And these stocks would go public at like a buck or two bucks. And during the time I was there, the stock went up to about 13 or $14. And it was my, I kept putting my commissions into that. And that's was really the thing that made me say, okay, you don't want to put people in jail for shoplifting for the rest of your life in drug stores and in supermarkets and, you know, clothing stores. Mm -hmm. And I just was so lucky that it was my uncle that night that said, all I've ever heard you talk about your entire life is restaurants, go do it. And yeah. so I did, I did it. And I'm, I haven't, haven't regretted one day since. And, and so even in, in him saying that, that you're going to spend more time being dead than alive. I mean, on the flip side, it's not like restaurants are this highly, you know, successful, you know, path forward. I mean, failure rates, I, I would imagine are, were even high back then. Was there any kind of fear around that? No, because I think as is the case with many entrepreneurs, you included, mm -hmm. when you are really passionate about something and there's an idea that you just, you have this aha moment. And my aha moment was very, very straightforward. It wasn't just that I wanted to be in the restaurant business. It's that at that time in New York, in the mid 1980s, we had come out of the disco era of the 70s and then the exclusive nightclub Studio 54 era of the early 80s. And every time I went out to eat in New York, the restaurant thought it was a nightclub and they decided who they were gonna be nice to and who they weren't gonna be nice to. And so my aha moment of a problem I wanted to solve was, could I create a restaurant that if only it existed would be my favorite restaurant? And it was very simple, it was two things. It's like, I want really good food and I want them to be nice to me. And in St. Louis, they were nice to me, but the food wasn't so great. And in New York, the food was really good, but they weren't very nice to me. Yeah. Um, and so all I did was put those two things together. And I, it, it didn't dawn on me that this might not work. And the good news is if it had failed, 
it truly would have been like a tree falling in the forest with no one to hear it because no one had ever heard of me. I had absolutely nothing to lose except, you know, the $740,000 that I cobbled together through my savings, my aunt, an uncle, and my mom. And they lent me money. And I mean, today I can barely build a, a restroom in the dining room for $740,000. Mm-hmm. But I got a nice restaurant out of the deal. And that was the one and only restaurant I had for the first third of my career before opening Gramercy Tavern. And then, you know, a whole bunch of stuff after that. And, uh, you know, you, you talked about you wanted to build your favorite restaurant. And I, I listened to an interview with you when you talked about the difference between the best restaurant and someone's favorite restaurant. And um, one thing that stuck with me is you saying, you can argue with someone about it being the best restaurant, but when you say it's your favorite, you can't argue with that. I think that was, that, that was a really profound statement. Um, in terms of, as you, as you kind of opened Union Square Cafe and, and you started building that, um, you, you talk so much about culture and values and, and have been kind of leading the way in, in this industry. At what point, in your time at Union Square, did you really introduce a hard set of values that you hired, promoted, and fired by? Well, I was much, much better, quite frankly, at developing a philosophy around hiring than I was around firing. But I I did believe at an early age that, um, and maybe an early stage of my career, that you can truly learn as much about a company based on the professional and caring way with which they fire people as, as you can by the way in which they hire people. But I was very, very focused on how to hire people. At the beginning, it was about as rudimentary and possibly illegal as you can imagine. And what I did was if I knew you were from New York, you probably were not going to get a job because in my judgment in those early days of the 1980s, New Yorkers weren't as nice as people from where I came from in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And I knew I wanted to hire nice people. It was probably illegal. And it was, it was really stupid. Then I started hiring New Yorkers who were nice. And I realized how stupid I had been. And then I decided to do another thing, which I no longer do. And I would ask people, what's your favorite mayonnaise? And that was all I needed to know because if it was Hellman's, they were going to get the job. And if it was Miracle Whip, they weren't. And (laughs) then I realized that was stupid. I stopped doing that. Um, But then I, the kinds of questions I was asking, you know, when I would see someone who would answer that same question by saying aioli or, you know, you, I found that I was, while the questions were not necessarily great questions, how have you used your sense of humor um, in, your, in your past jobs? I was asking the kind of questions that made people think differently about the profession they were getting into. And over time, we established what we call the um, really the elements of, of having a high HQ, high hospitality quotient. And it's 100% of how we hire today is the 51% is 100% of how we hire people other than if they're in the kitchen and they need really strong technical skills. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll take Shake Shack as an example because Shake Shack, nobody in the history of Shake Shack, which started in 2004, has ever been asked to show on their resume, uh, how many jobs they've made milkshakes in, or how many times they've, you know, made a hot dog. Mm -hmm. And therefore, 100% of what we're hiring for at a restaurant like Shake Shack, and I would say that even in our full service fine dining restaurants at Union Square Hospitality Group, um, what we're looking for as a beginning point are the, the six emotional skills that are always present at a very, very high level and someone who's got a high hospitality quotient, high HQ. And uh, someone with a high HQ, you can't change it in the same way that whatever our respective IQ, IQs are, it is what it is. And, you know, I could 
I could read the whole dictionary tonight and it's not going to change my IQ because an IQ is just a way of saying, what's, what's your propensity to learn stuff? And what I believe an HQ is, is a way to say, what's your propensity to care about making other people feel better when you do the thing you do? And in the same way that I don't place value judgments on people uh, about their IQ, which is good because mine is probably pretty low, I don't place value judgments on people with respect to their HQ. However, I do have to have a point of view about hiring people with a high HQ mm -hmm. in a business, especially, which I, I believe all businesses are actually in the hospitality business today, but um, it matters a lot to me. And so the six emotional skills we have seen very intentionally, and we really try to hire for these. Mm -hmm. This is all gonna sound quite obvious, but you can really up your game. Um, yeah are basically beginning with kind optimism. And I could, I could kind of shut up right now and just say the whole thing is, if someone has got kind eyes, that, that's almost enough right there because you cannot, you cannot uh, fool me or anybody. Your eyes have been expressing who you are for your entire life. And if you're an angry person, it shows. If you're a worried person, it shows. If you have smiled a lot, it shows. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing is kind optimism. We need people, and the optimistic part is important. Cynics and skeptics, it's not a bad thing for each of us to have a little bit of that in us, but if the primary emotion is cynicism, it's not necessarily gonna be a good thing. Um, the second one is curiosity. Again, an obvious thing, but we are in a business that is about trying to honor the work we did yesterday, even though we made a ton of mistakes because we always do, but be curious about how you can make life a little bit better today, work better. What can you learn that you didn't already know? We don't want to hire finished products. Uh, we want to hire people who are constantly learning and who are, who are curious about learning. The third is work ethic. Um, we can all train each other how to do something, but there's an emotional skill that you either have or you don't, which is that you care deeply about doing something incredibly well. And the fourth is empathy, which is the ability and natural instinct to, to try to walk in someone else's shoes and to say, how would I feel if I were that person in this situation and how would I want to be treated? And one of the great things that we uncovered is that as much as we all learned the golden rule of hospitality, excuse me, the golden rule period at a young age, do unto others as you would want done unto you. We unearthed that there's, there's a subtle but powerful difference that the golden rule of hospitality is do unto others as you believe they would want done unto them. Very different because we're all different people and hospitality exists when the person on the receiving end of your work truly believes you're on their side. And the only way to be on someone's side is to realize that everybody is different. Everybody's got a different way of, of feeling better. So do unto others as you believe they would want to do unto them. So that's empathy. And then is self-awareness, which is understanding what your personal weather report is on any given day. And it's different every day. Um, and you know, if, if you're having one of those wonderful 72 degree, no humidity, sunny days, you better spread that everywhere. And if you're having one of the kind of days we had earlier this week in New York, which was miserable, it was, you know, 92 degrees and a million percent humidity. Mm -hmm. Go take a shower, but get out of my way because you're, you're not going to make, as, as one of my workmates, it's not going to be fun to be around you. And the sixth emotional skill we try to hire for is maybe it's maybe it should have been the first. It's integrity, which is having the judgment to do the right thing, even when it may not be in your own self-interest. And and so now if you if we can hire somebody who's great at the stuff they do, and we we ascribe 49 points, we want to get 100 points. Mm -hmm. 
most points you can get for being amazing at what you do, whether you're the pasta cook or the maitre d' or the sommelier or the, I don't know, the chief technology officer in our company. Most points you can get for being amazing at what you do is 49. That yeah. leaves 51 points for who you are while you're doing it. And here's the last thing I'll say, Jordan, because I, I can feel you've got 18 more questions and you want me to shut up on this one. No, 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 but, no, 19. What are you talking about? All right, so I'll be quick on this, but um, <laughs> I hope I hope this will ring. Can I talk about hockey for a second? Oh, all you people of up there in Canada. So I, I grew up watching the St. Louis Blues play and um, and you could always tell and unfortunately, they didn't win their first Stanley Cup till a couple of years ago, but it was still fun to go to the games. But all the statistics that you get from a hockey team are what happened when they're on the ice. And yet, if you look at a typical hockey game, right, so the goals scored, shorthanded goals, goals against, all that, all that kind of stuff. All the statistics are when they're on the ice, but a, a typical hockey player is actually on the bench for about two thirds of the game, more or less. And so I'm fascinated by what is the impact of that player when they're on the bench? How do they make the rest of their team better by virtue of who they are? And, and I think business is a lot like that as well. And so that's why in our recipe, we wanna get a hundred, but we split it up and we make it very clear to people, when you get a, a bonus, 49% of your bonus of your review is going to be based on the degree to which you hit all the metrics that, that the business needs to hit. 51% of your review is subjective, but it's going to be a 360 review of who you are while you're doing it and how much better you're making the rest of the team. And the best way to make the rest of the team better is to make this a better place to work because great people want to work with great people. And then it really becomes a, a flywheel that goes up. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, and and by all and and we've uh, there was actually a comment here from from Stacy. Um, and I, I actually remember this, Denny. I don't. Do, did you know that the the St. Louis Blues were going to be like? I think it was they were going to be the Saskatoon Blues at one point. I'm not even making this up. Quote me if like does it, does anyone remember this? Do you guys? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna look it up. Saskatoon, remember this? Yeah, I have stickers that say Saskatoon's got the blues. Like they're at my parents' house. They were going to be the Saskatoon blues at one point. <laughs> going to be sold, I think. Uh, anyway, there was some sort of like thing that happened. It was a very small stint, but we'll have to send you the articles, Danny. It was kind of yeah. I'd love to see that. Thanks, Stacy. Um, you know, I I I I want to bring up one of these quotes from uh, I think it was Jim Sullivan, a restaurant consultant, and it just kind of rang. It, it kind of made me pause a little bit for when you were talking about this 51% for, you know, their HQ and 49% training. Um, he says, we're better at training than we are at recruiting. So we hurry, hire the wrong people and hope training will fix them, but there's no right way to develop the wrong person. Is that essentially how you think about this? In a word? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that yeah and, and by the way, I've spent, you, you asked me at the very beginning and I, I didn't do a good job of answering, but um, I would say that one of my greatest strengths, like anyone, is also my greatest weakness when you take it too far. And one of my greatest strengths is that I'm incredibly patient with people. Because um, I, be I believe in, I believe that most people come to work hoping to do a good job and hoping to do a better job and hoping to grow. Um, and, and what I had to figure out was that while it's great to be patient with someone when you can get them, when you can help them get themselves over the hump, there are some people who just either can't or who won't. Mm -hmm. And so that's when we came. And, and so I was sometimes so patient that I was hanging in there with people who just should not have been on our team. And I found myself as a leader sending out therefore mixed messages. When I talk about excellence and hospitality being the two things we're trying to to excel at and people on the team would say all right we hear you danny but if you're really about excellence why is that person still on our team or if you're really about hospitality why is that person still on our team and so 
I think we've gotten much, much better at the exiting part of this, which is crucial for building a culture because a culture is really the sum of the behaviors that you champion minus the behaviors that you tolerate. And if there are too many of the behaviors that you tolerate that you didn't get rid of, then you're, you're, you're just sending mixed messages and you'll end up being a, a mediocre team. And that's something we've really had to work at. And I think we're much, much better at it now. Yeah, that, that's especially important, I think, for first-time managers in general, because I do think there's that willingness to take that responsibility of, oh, I hired this person. I need to make them successful. But, you know, from what I'm hearing from you, and, and I think we, we agree as well, is there is a point where, you know, you're, you're kind of, you can't just keep carrying someone through the mud in, you know, in, in a battlefield, you know, they have to, they also have to get up and walk with you and, and you kind of, you got to meet both ways. And I think that's a, that's something that in general, I think a lot of new managers struggle with. Um, in terms of, in terms of the, um, the, the pandemic, just to talk about this for a minute, because obviously our industry was hugely impacted by the pandemic. And I, know that uh, yourself and the USHG team were among the first to kind of take action into furloughing several of the, uh, you know, USHG staff, you know, I'm just curious because we had to do that ourselves. We had to furlough 25% of our staff and thankfully people were very understanding and we could bring, you know, most of them back. And, um, you know, most, for the most part, people were asking, you know, when could they come back and they understood and everything. And while I was happy to hear that, I also kind of, you know, want to, I, I was curious to know how it impacted your team when this all happened and not just the people that were there, but the people that were furloughed. How did they react to that? Well, everybody reacted differently. Nobody was happy about it. That's for sure. Um, we had survivor's guilt sometimes for people who were not laid off. We had um, amazing grace in many cases are people who were laid off. But keep in mind, one of the first things we did um, after reaching the conclusion that the only way to be a good employer was to stay in business. And if we had no revenue, and it was really scary in the early days in New York because we were seeing people, you, you couldn't go out of your apartment in those early days without seeing an ambulance. We all knew people who died we lost a couple of people from our world of our restaurant world. And so everyone knew this was, this was the real thing. This is serious. Um, but the first thing we did was we set up a 501c3, a, a not-for-profit legal organization. And we worked with many of our regular guests and our staff. We held auctions. We, we sold gift cards where a hundred percent of the proceeds went to our employee relief fund, which we called HUGS. And we succeeded in raising $2 million, um, which we were then able to uh, grant out to, to people. And then we would have a weekly call, a Zoom call like this, but with, we had laid off close to 2,000 people. So 2,000 people didn't tune into the Zoom call, but 2,000 people were invited on a weekly basis. And we would bring people up to date on what we knew. We tried to balance reality and hope uh, together. We, we set up a jobs board where we reached out to like-hearted companies who were actually thriving through the pandemic, like Whole Foods, for example, um, or some of the internet uh, marketing platforms uh, or businesses. One of our uh, EHI investments is Gold Belly. They were thriving. I mean, they they were setting records during the pandemic because people wanted food shipped across the country. And uh, we set up some emotional health resources. So, you know, we couldn't do, we didn't create the pandemic and we didn't create the no revenue situation. And we knew that we were going to have to make some really like hopefully never again decisions, but there was still a way we hoped that we could do it in a way that people would look back and say, you know, I hated getting laid off, but at least here's how they did it. Yeah. And did, 
did most of those workers end up coming back or did you guys experience some of those workers go on to other industries during that time? Well, it's too soon to answer the question fully. Mm -hmm. um, people are asking me all the time, is, is the labor shortage impacting you in, in your New York restaurants? And what I would say is that it is, but not as dramatically as what I'm hearing a lot of our restaurant colleagues say. And, and I'm not sure why. I'm, it could be because um, if you just do the math, we've, we, have, we have our entire alumni base wherever they now happen to live and many of them left New York. But nonetheless, we have, let's say an alumni base of 2000 people. We're now back up to 750. Um, and of that base, we've only reopened half of our restaurants so far. And of those half of our restaurants, we've only opened them for, uh, for dinner. And so, so if you just do the math, we actually, we probably have more, and, and we've been moving people around and giving people the opportunity. If, if you know the Union Square Hospitality Group way, I'm delighted to hire you at any Union Square Hospitality Group restaurant. Now, obviously, cooks may have specific skills that you may be the best barbecue pit master from Blue Smoke, and that may or may not lend itself to, say, Gramercy Tavern. But there's a lot of positions that we can move around. So I think for those reasons, so far, it has not been too bad. Now, you want to talk to me in a couple of months when we have just about all of our restaurants reopened at that point. We'll see what happens. All that said, um, there's two topics. One is I have absolutely no question that we're, we're in for a bumpy summer when it comes to employment. Um, in New York City, we still don't have Broadway, so we don't have tourists coming. Um, it's the summer, and so a lot of people are going to say, you know, that quarantine thing and that working from home thing, not so bad. I'm going to take this last summer off. But in September, Broadway comes back. Schools will start in person for the first time. Extended unemployment insurance will end. Um, and I just believe that come September, we're going we're gonna to see, hopefully, a big return, not only to dining, but hopefully, with the increased demand of diners, we'll have an increased demand of people wanting to work here. And with that said, one of the things we love about Seven Shifts is the opportunity to do an even better job of staying in touch with our employee base um, because retention is probably by a factor of three or four or five more important than hiring in the first place. You get someone great and you lose them, it's terrible. It costs a, it costs a fortune. Um, it costs you a lot more than if you never had hired that person in the first place. So. We're really excited about the tools that you provide us with um, to retain great employees and ultimately to make it a better place to work because that, that's our point of view is whether we are an employer or a restaurant, we've never done our best ever work. We can always do better. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And obviously the pandemic was had a very negative effect, um, but do you think there's any good to come out of it as it relates to just being a restaurant operator? Like, have you seen change amongst your colleagues or your peers um, as it relates to like a mindset shift in terms of how they operate, how they think of their teams? Has there been any, been any of those types of discussions? Well, I just had a discussion like that this morning with a restaurant colleague in New York. Um, and we're having tons and tons of discussions. I've, I've never seen our industry collaborate more more constructively, you know, for an industry that's inherently competitive with one another, this pandemic brought about a uh, coordinated collegiality that has just been heartwarming and, you know, working with both local and state and federal government uh, on various ways to make our industry better and more sustainable. And I just had a long conversation with, with a, uh, a wonderful industry colleague this morning um, and he started the conversation and it was really about 
how to improve the, the workplace model for people in our industry. Um, we will definitely be introducing him to seven shifts. He may already be a customer for all I know, but we'll talk about that offline. And, um, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot is the compensation model, where in the United States, it's illegal in many places, including New York, for tips to be shared between dining room workers and kitchen workers. And that has, um, that's completely exacerbated the growing disparity between what half of our workers can make and what the other half can make. And so we're really trying to work on like, why, why would you want to be a cook? You just, why would you want to go to culinary school when you might even be able to make more money as a fast food worker um, than you could in a fine dining restaurant? So to answer your question, yes, there's a lot of people thinking about this right now. And, and it, it, should be, it should be the outcome of COVID for our industry because our industry had all kinds of preconditions going into COVID and if we're too dumb to get healthy right now, then shame on us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also, I also think uh, it, it just sounds like from talking to a lot of operators, it, it's, there was, there was already a wound, like you said, in the, in the industry, there's always kind of some ruins and basically a salt shaker was poured directly into the wound. Um, it's kind of the analogy that I heard too. Um, in terms of the, uh, in, in terms of some of the mindset shifts that operators are going through um, and, and the value, I guess, they're, they're putting on their staff, um, we see there's, there's kind of like this debate even as it relates to minimum wage. And I've talked to operators more recently in some parts that are just completely bellyaching about it and, and kind of more so complaining about the government, so not like basically supporting people to stay at home when on the flip side, I see some other folks that have been adapting a lot better to this environment. Is this kind of what you're seeing too in terms of the outcome being survival of the fittest? It's a tough question, Jordan. Um, I think, again, it may be a little too soon to tell. I, I don't think any of us can conclusively say that the worker shortage is because of $300 a week extended minimum extended um, unemployment insurance. I think minimum wage, um, the, the fact that in our country, we have a different minimum wage for tipped employees and non-tipped employees has been something that um, I've been really trying to rail against forever. I, I may have done it the wrong way initially when eliminating tipping in our restaurants in 2015 which set up a very, very hard mathematical equation to take care of everybody in all the ways we wanted to and not have menu pricing that was non-competitive with everybody else, uh, which is why we've now moved back to a tipping situation and we pay a revenue share to our kitchen. Um, that is legal to do. That's coming out of our pocket. Mm -hmm. We can't up our menu prices as a result. Um, I just, I just think we're going to have to wait and see how this goes. There's the, the extended unemployment insurance in the United States. Um, if that is something that has kept people at home, um, it, you can't just say that's the only reason. It, it may be that home is better than work. And man, I love going to work because I love the group of people I get to work with and I love the stuff we get to do and the problems we get to solve. And um, I think it may also say that we're not making work in our industry a place you love doing. Um, we're also at a time when uh, so many people have been able to work from home as we're doing on Zoom right now, but our industry can't, can't cook food on Zoom and do, do the dishes on Zoom and pour someone a, a bottle of wine on Zoom and so while people in our industry are watching their friends, maybe their, their family members have this time at home and, you know, get, get all their work done on their computer and then go out and take a nice walk while I'm working till midnight and, um, you know, and then before the vaccine came out, 
putting myself in harm's way, I might add. I can understand where a lot of people may not have said, that's what I choose to do right now. So it is incumbent upon us in this industry to ask ourselves, how do we make this amazing work? And it is amazing work. It's, it's not for everybody, obviously, but if, if you love making people feel better and you happen to love good stuff on the plate and good stuff in the glass and sharing that with people and watching memories be made, it's great. It's great work. And then what we have to do is take stock of the stuff that isn't great, mm-hmm. um, some of which is societal. Um, you know, and I, I think we're capable of doing this. So mm-hmm. I'm answering your question. Our industry is aware of this, capable of it. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who run scared and they're not interested in changing things. But if we miss this opportunity that we were given this year, to take our boat out of the water, put it in a dry dock, scrub all the barnacles off the bottom, patch all the holes before we put it back in the water. Shame on us. I've said that now twice, but we got to get, we have this chance to get it right. And and we're determined to lead as much as we possibly can and lead from within, within our own company. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm conscious of time here and I know that we had some, some questions submitted. So I want to call upon first some, some folks that did, I know there's going to be questions from folks that didn't submit some questions ahead of time, but let's go through the, the ones that did to start off. Uh, Brent, are you there? I see you. You can't hide Brent. (laughs) Yeah, I'm here. Brent, did you want to ask uh, Danny your question? Yeah, sure. So you talked about um, some of the challenges facing the restaurant industry. I think we see a lot of those challenges here as opportunities at Seven Shifts or things that we can help solve. Um, You mentioned a few of them, but I guess my question to you is what's the biggest challenge in the industry or opportunity that Seven Shifts should be trying to capitalize on or that you think Seven Shifts can help the industry with right now? Uh, What a great question. I I think the biggest uh, the biggest thing that I think our industry needs to do is to get to become a place that is far more diverse in terms of the people who we hire and far more inclusive to make it a place of belonging. And when we do that, we will be much better restaurants for our guests. Um, it's, it's very apparent to me that, um, that we, we don't necessarily look like the cities that we work in or serve in our industry. And, and that gets to some of the compensation model as well, because we know statistically that dining room staffs make sometimes up to uh, three times what kitchen staffs make. And dining room staffs are much whiter and kitchen staffs are much more people of color. And so what that means is that without wanting to, meaning to, um, when we open our doors and when people spend money in our restaurants, we are actually perpetuating some of the the things that are inhospitable that don't make people feel like they belong. And I think our industry could be on the forefront of every industry because we are, I, I believe just about next to government, the biggest employer Um, in the aggregate that there is. And so imagine what we could do if we created better jobs with much more upward mobility and we could be the change that we want to see in in our whole society. So if you can help with that, I also think it, it talks, it, it actually addresses the other thing we were talking about, which is that while our industry is crying out for more workers, there are people who are, crying out for more jobs. And what if we could build a bridge and, you know, bring much, and by the way, when I talk about diversity, I'm not only talking about race or gender. I'm even talking about where do we source our talent from? Are we willing in our country, which has more people incarcerated than any other country on earth to give people a chance who are incarcerated? Are we willing to give people a chance um, who may have a physical disability? Can we be the industry that that says, if you have a heart for hospitality and you've got a good work ethic, we want you. 
and we're going to work with you. So help us with that one. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next question uh, I wanted to, Fahog, are you there? Yep. Awesome. You can go ahead and uh, ask Danny your question. Yeah. Uh, so t two years ago, when I first joined Seven Shifts, I picked up your book, Setting the Table. It really helped me to understand restaurant as a business and people behind them, how they're trying to grow it, to manage it and make it uh, a success. Um, so one thing that stuck with me was um, the salt shaker theory. And I'm really curious to see if you are still using it at this different stage of your career and how, how is it helping you? Thank you. Uh, and I love that you're putting salt shaker in a better light than pouring salt on someone's wound like we were talking about earlier. <laughs> that Jordan actually gave me an idea that the next book should be um, should have the salt shaker upside down with it. No, I don't think I'll do that. Look, I think that the... Um, the principle of centering the salt shaker, which is, it's a, if you haven't read setting the table, it's a story. You can read it if you want to. Um, so I'm not going to tell the whole story right now, but it's truly about understanding what excellence looks like to you in anything that you do and recognizing when human behavior moves off the center of what excellence looks like and having the persistent ability to keep moving the salt shaker back to where it's supposed to be right in the center of the table. The expression we use is constant gentle pressure that you need all three of those things. It's gotta be constant, it's gotta be gentle and people need to feel the pressure. If you do any two of those without the other, it doesn't work. And I would say that the thinner the air gets, the more that matters because when, when times are more challenging for any business, the natural thing people do is they get afraid and they run away. They go into their lizard brain and they, you know, they run away. Um, and that's the time you most need to lean into. Nope. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. And how we do it, what your culture is, how we show up to work each day isn't just for good times. I would say it's especially for the tough times. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jada, are you there? I'm here, Jordan. All right. Fire away. Hey, Denny. So you've obviously had astronomical success in the restaurant business. Uh, my question is for you. What has been the biggest career mistake that you've made and what did you learn from it? Well, your, your premise Jade is flawed. I don't, I don't think we've had astronomical success and to the degree we have had any success, it's, uh, I'll tell you one thing, it never goes to our head. If you, if you give us a good review from one of our restaurants, we just try three times as hard tomorrow to prove that, that we weren't an imposter and maybe that's my problem. Um, I don't know if anyone on this call has imposter syndrome, but, um, it's, um, I think hospitality is a humble act. It's a humble thing to say, I trust that I will feel better if I first make you feel better. And I think that's, that's what hospitality is. Now, I make 15 to 20 pretty good mistakes every single day. It's hard to pick the biggest one because there's been so many. Um, the one that comes to my mind though is one that uh, it took me a few times to learn from. And for me, a big mistake is one that you didn't learn from. And that is connected to something you heard me talk about earlier, which is sticking with something too long because I'm such an optimist. And I just don't, I don't trust that we can't turn around a business. And so when I wrote setting the table, the opening line in setting the table was my biggest mistake. And it, it was something like in so many years, I've opened this many restaurants and I've never had the experience of closing any one of them. I would say writing that sentence was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made because implicit in that sentence was that there's something wrong with closing a restaurant. And then I got so much pride 
around that, that I didn't learn a really important lesson. And, and so the first restaurant I ever closed was in 2011, 2000, I think 2011 or 12, called Tabla. And it was a 13 year old restaurant, an Indian restaurant, it was really good. And it was losing money for the last uh, two or three years of its existence. And I hung in there because I did not want to, I didn't want to lay off all those people and I didn't want to have to rewrite my book. And that was just foolish, foolish pride at work. And, and meanwhile, I was actually doing the worst thing I could have done for those 134 people because I was trading on their loyalty. No one was getting a raise. No one was getting a promotion. They were working even harder for a business that was going nowhere. And, um, and then I finally made the decision to close it. And since that time, I think we've closed. So that means I went um, 26 years in a, in a career without ever closing a restaurant. And that was just a big mistake. I should have done it sooner. And I learned the lesson about how entrepreneurs should fail and they should fail fast. Because if you're not failing, you're not probably trying out enough new stuff and you're, or you're not being bold enough, you're playing it too safe. And, um, but, they, but you gotta do it quickly. And so when we closed a fast casual pizza restaurant called Martina, I was, I was proud that that only took 13 months. Um, as opposed to 13 years. Great, thanks for sharing. Thanks, Danny. Um, great question. And next up, Katie G, are you there? I am here, thank you. Um, such great questions. Mine is pretty simple, um, but- Thank you. Some, of us, <laughs> some <laughs> of us being from Toronto, if you've been to Toronto, I would love to hear um, what one or two of your favorite restaurants there. If not, would love to hear about your favorite restaurants in New York. I have been in Toronto. Um, and even though I was only there for about 30 hours, I managed to have about six meals. <laughs> and I, uh, there's, a, there's a market that you guys have there that was a lot of fun. And I had this amazing pea meal sandwich. Do you know what that is? St. Lawrence Market. Pea, pea. <laughs> Email bacon, is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah, that was good. Um, I went to a restaurant. I've got a quick story I've got to share with you. And you'll see why I'll never forget it. Although I think I've forgotten the name. Is it Richmond Station? Richmond. Pretty sure it's called Richmond Station. Yep. And I, uh, I was by myself. And they have a long kind of communal place to sit. And I ordered my lunch and I could sort of see out of the corner of my eye that the bartender and the owner were having a conversation amongst themselves. And one of them pointed at me. They didn't see that I was looking. And uh, the next thing I know, I got my lunch. Food was absolutely delicious. The, um, the bartender comes up to me with a Gramercy Tavern cookbook and says, are you Danny Meyer? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, you won't believe this coincidence, but one of our longtime cooks is leaving after being here for seven years. And we went out this morning to buy this cookbook as a going away gift because Gramercy Tavern is his favorite restaurant. Would you sign it? So I said, of course I would. I'm really honored. Now I asked for my check so I can get onto my second lunch. And all of a sudden the owner comes out and introduces himself and brings me this like three foot tall trophy. <laughs> and, it's, and it's got these little brass plaques all the way around it. And it's called the Danny Meyer Hospitality Prize. And they give it on a monthly basis and I'm going like, how did I find you guys here? This is amazing. And I'd only found it because I was asking someone who lives in Toronto, where should I have lunch? And they gave it to me. All right, that's my story. But the other, there was a place that made some of the most delicious focaccia. And it's just, it's driving me crazy that I can't think of the name of it. 
starts with a T. It's in a really neat neighborhood. Sorry, we don't need to waste everyone's time. Oh, yeah, my that's it. That's it. You got it. That was good. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Thanks, Very Katie. Cool. All right. We will uh, move down the list here for another question. Um, Johannes, are you there? I am here. Hey, Danny, thanks so much for taking the time for this. This has been awesome. Um, my, my question is, I have one question and a follow-up. Uh, so throughout your journey in restaurants, when did you realize that technology was the differentiator of success of an operation? Um, and kind of pivoting from that is like, what was the driver for you to go from restaurateur to technology investor? Another great question. You guys are awesome. Um, so about six months before opening my first restaurant, Union Square Cafe, I was 27 years old. And I went to the National Restaurant Association show, the NRA show in Chicago, which is like the biggest trade show in America. And it was the year that um, this company, which may have been a Canadian company called Romanco, you guys probably have never heard of it, probably stood for restaurant management company, came out with the first sort of point of sale system. And you, the way it worked is um, you got this like prehistoric screen. It wasn't a touch screen, like the buttons actually push things. And you kept a, a menu on the side with a four digit code for every menu item. And you would go four, two, three, seven times two, two, you know, two bowls of pasta. And then, you know, forget about modifying something. And I went to, to see this being demonstrated. And by the way, the check would come out of a thermal printer and it looked like a, a roll of toilet paper when it came out. And, um, and I said, because my only experience before that was the big, beautiful NCR cash register that sat on the back bar. It was truly part of the restaurant's decor, you know? And so I'm this guy, I don't even own my restaurant yet because this was May and I wouldn't open it till October. And I got the courage to ask a question. And I said, how are guests going to feel if they get their guest check on a piece of toilet paper. And this uh, old time restaurateur happened to be sitting right in front of me. This was probably a 60 people in the audience. And he stands up, I'm now sitting, and he turns around and looks at me. And he said, son, I don't know what your experience is in this business, but if you treat people right, give them good value and a good plate of food, you can give them their check on an actual piece of toilet paper and they'll come back. You need to get with technology. So that was, that was my first lesson. And then we didn't have a whole lot of technology for years. I mean, we were using maybe fax machine was my biggest piece of technology for two years. We finally started printing our menus daily on a thermal, some kind of printer. And um, I'd say the first time I really, really got with the program in the Sure. In the early 1990s, no, thank you. I decided I, nice I, wanted day. To, I decided I wanted to incorporate a new business, and I, I did. I called it Maitre D Inc. And it was to actually create an electronic database for all of our for all of our guests because I knew I couldn't be there every shift, and I wanted to see. I wanted to remember, you know, who's allergic to this or likes this server or likes that table, what their birthday is. And the good news is I did nothing with it. But in the late um, 1990s, all of a sudden, I started getting knocks on the door from a bunch of people who were getting into the online reservation business that would have um, an electronic database, obviously, to go with it and a digital database. And I was just really fortunate to, of the five, I, I handicapped them myself and I liked open table the best. And I made the biggest investment I've ever made in my life, went on the board of directors, this was in 2000. And I got an amazing education by going out to San Francisco four times a year. The board was people from Amazon, Netflix, um, 
lots and lots of people who were connected. Even the VC people were, were all people who were connected to Silicon Valley. And I just got this whole new way of thinking that I never had had as a restaurateur, which is we, we operate within four walls and the best you can do is sell out your, your dinner service. Whereas with technology, if you had the right idea, sky was the limit. You know, it's, there's no walls. And I just got really excited about that. And then I started surrounding myself with people on our team in our restaurants who were equally excited, not just about what technology could do for hospitality, but we started looking for any kind of product that could use tech to advance touch. That, that's what our internal slogan was, tech to advance touch. And one by one, we started uh, meeting people and I made a couple of my own investments before we had Enlightened Hospitality Investments sometimes not in the restaurant space. There was one called Today Ticks, which was really disrupting the ability to buy last minute theater tickets in New York. And, but always with a focus on businesses that were trying to make life more hospitable for people. Um, Bento Box is one that we invested in early on. Um, then when Open Table was acquired and there was no more board, that made us free to see what was next. And we invested in Resi at that point, which subsequently got it acquired by American Express. Um, but it's a, every business is a hospitality business and every hospitality business should be a technology business. Um, not that the end product of what we do is technology, but anytime technology can help us spend more time having better relationships with people whether they're the people who work for us or the people who are spending money at our restaurants, that's a good thing. Awesome. Great question, Joey. And, and thanks, thanks for answering that, Dan. I know we're, uh, we're a bit over time here. So I want to, um, I think before we head out, I was wondering maybe if we can get a picture here. I know we're all kind of remote, but if we all, you know, either the people in the Saskatoon office, maybe we can stand up here, you know, Danny, you, you, I don't know if you can see it, but you're on a huge screen in our Saskatoon office and it'd be, and it'd be great if, yeah, we could see you and wearing the shirt and then we'll have a few of us around. We'll snap a picture and we'll also get folks on the zoom call to kind of wave at the same time. Just a nice little picture. We'll do that. Oh my God. Look at all these people in real life. Yeah. Yeah. We need, and we need to see your logo too, Danny. All right, everybody. Oh, <laughs> he's like, everybody wave. Awesome, got it. All right, Danny, on, on behalf of everyone at Seven Shifts, thank you for partnering up with Seven Shifts on this journey. We're super excited to, to, to you know, provide a, a lot of value with, for restaurants as they continue to open up. And uh, thank you again so much for spending time with us here today. I know you're a busy guy. And I think, I don't know, I probably speak for everyone by saying that was incredibly inspiring and so validating in terms of how we think about our customers and how we want to even build our own company. So thank you so much. Let's give them well, I want to, th Jordan, thank you. And uh, I'm seeing all these wonderful messages coming across on the chat box. So you guys are warming my heart and it's an amazing way to start the weekend. Thank you for all you do, you guys. <laughs> Great to hear. All right. Give Danny a round of applause, everyone. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Seven Shifts Restaurant Management and Growth Podcast. For more great content, you can check out our blog at sevenshifts.com slash blog. You can also find us on every social media platform, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, at Seven Shifts. Thanks again.